today on CityCast Denver. Cherry Creek Week continues. Thanks to our sponsor, Transportation Solutions, we're spending a whole week looking at the future of one neighborhood where questions of growth and density are very, very real. And this time, I'm talking to the developer behind one of those big changes. You know those weird, mostly empty parking lots west of the mall with the old Bed Bath & Beyond building? If developer Amy Cara has her way, that's going to look way different in 10 years. And stick around because I also talked to a developer working in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., who just may have figured out this whole density thing without pissing off the neighbors. Today is Thursday, April 20th. I'm Bree Davies, and here's what Denver's talking about. Amy Cara, welcome to CityCast Denver. Thanks for having me. So Amy, tell me about Cherry Creek West. Well, ultimately, we intend to essentially finish out a lot of the vision of Cherry Creek. There's been a lot of planning that the city's done, that the neighborhood has done to really build this area out in a way um, that provides great community for everyone. And I think one of the things that we can really do is bring the opportunity for this to truly be a 15-minute community to the neighborhood. But more importantly, we're creating a pedestrian-first community that has what we're calling the neighborhood's new front yard. Um, as well as a new market square that'll be a great new place for the farmer's market that exists there today, as well as connections between Cherry Creek North and the creek itself, um, connecting the communities to the south and the north and the east and the west to one another through our site. So those are big pieces that are important to us. You know, when I say the 15 minute community idea, the idea is we um, really create that additional opportunity for more people to live here who work here and more people who work here to live here. And then also have the ability to do all the other things that they would need to do on foot, medical services, grocery shopping, all of the things that you need to do to be able to leave your car behind are a big goal for us. Um, And for that reason, the majority of our parking is in one big reservoir below the site so that we can really focus on the pedestrian at grade. Interesting. Okay. So really quickly, before we move forward, I just want to give folks a picture of what or where Cherry Creek West is going in. Because you mentioned the farmer's market, which a lot of folks will know happens in this sort of empty sea of parking lots that is for a long time surrounded uh, what was most recently Bed Bath & Beyond. Um, But would you just give us sort of a geographical explanation of where Cherry Creek West, this development is going? Yeah, Cherry Creek West is bounded. um, It's really right at the corner of First and University. And then it is bounded on the other two sides by Clayton Lane, which is actually a private drive that is a connection into the shopping center today. And Cherry Creek North Drive, which is um, also a private drive that is to the south of our site. And what's unique about that is that that is because it's private, we can actually rethink that while we're thinking about the creek connection. Um, And that's one of the really unique things that we can deliver there. But yeah, it's uh, just shy of 13 acre site that is right now a sea of parking lots and heat island effect uh, that we look forward to greenifying and um, making a really great place to be. So I'm very familiar with this area. I worked at that mall for a long time. This section where Cherry Creek West will go in is sort of the last, it's the vestige of an old shopping area. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of been in this weird limbo, I think, for a long time. I wonder how you all got in, how did you get involved with this project and and why did you want to do something in Cherry Creek? Yeah, yeah. No, great question. Um, East West Partners has been developing in Denver for 23 years, uh, 24 actually, just about. And uh, what we really like are locations where it's more than just buildings, but an opportunity to think about the places in between and how people like to move. I think Denver Union Station and the public plazas and all of the outdoor space and that orientation to that is sort of an example of that, if that helps. Um, This seems like a very forgotten location in a place that the community really wants to see change. And we like to go places (laughs) where we're wanted, candidly. And uh, we've, for that reason, been really well received so far. But I think, you know, it feels, I mentioned the 15-minute community, it feels like if there were um, more residential and some affordable housing here, as well as some more office that you'll really finally be at that critical mass that people can just park their car once and live and, and work here. Yeah. 
you're correct. The community has long wanted something to do, something to happen with this, again, a sort of outdated model of parking lots, massive parking lots surrounding a pretty small area of, of shopping. Um, but also at the same time, I hear the community saying, we don't want a bunch of more giant buildings. So what what is the balance here? How do you how do you approach this? And what do you say to those neighbors that are concerned about what they believe to be a concern about the character of the neighborhood? Yeah, well, so it's interesting. We've been engaging with the community since the end of 2021. Um, we've met with lots of HOAs. We've met with the Cherry Creek Steering Committee. I think you guys have, are speaking with Lou Raiders if you haven't yet. And with folks over in the Country Club neighborhood, we've had a public CIM, our community information meeting. It's a, the kind of thing the city um, coordinates. And really, we've actually heard support for the heights that we're talking about. And that's because we're staying within the guidelines of what Blueprint Denver and the Cherry Creek Area Plan, which was a community front plan, um, really came up with. And that means that our density is very consistent with what's happening in Cherry Creek North and what's happening to the south of us. So our buildings, there will be seven of them. They will be ranging um, around eight to 13 stories. We want them to be variable because that really provides context and helps them feel like they're knitting into the neighborhood. That plus architectural vari variability so that um, you don't have this sort of campus feel or this everything here arrived in 2025 and it doesn't <laughs> uh, doesn't stand the test of time. So in answer to your question, we really haven't heard a lot of objection so far. Uh, people are curious about things like height and views, traffic impacts, you know, they always are, um, and construction impacts, like how is this going to impact me? It's incumbent on us to make sure that we keep answering all those questions as we continue. Um, but really, I think the other things we're delivering, the green space, the connection to the creek, the improvements around um, how that creek experience are, really are great things that offset some of those other concerns. And um, if we were going to be 20 stories tall or something, I think we would probably be hearing from people. That's a good point. I think there's a great difference between uh, 12 stories versus 20 stories. And it's actually not as uncommon in that area at this point. So you've kind of talked about the built environment around the mall and it's uh, sort of in conversation with this this new project you're working on. Um, but I'm thinking about like, how does this this development want to interact with the mall? Maybe more like on a people level, like you talked about affordable housing. Is this maybe somewhere that mall workers could finally live in the neighborhood where they work? Yeah, actually, that's one of the things we're really excited about. So we're doing 12 percent, um, 60 percent maximum AMI. And I like to talk about what that is because I think it's sort of an obtuse concept. Yeah. But 60 percent AMI is um, for a single person. That's about forty nine thousand a year. So you can start to imagine how this really creates an opportunity for people who are working at the mall, people who are working in retail and restaurants over in Cherry Creek North could actually live here. And the opportunities around that are massive. The people who come in to work in this neighborhood are coming from way out east. They're coming from the federal corridor. And so that's, you know, traffic on our roads. That's uh, people relying on transit, which hasn't been quite as strong as it has been. Um, and, and so if some of those people could be living here and be part of that 15 minute community promise, I think that's a great opportunity. I also think even if you don't live here, the fact that we're going to have this publicly available green space and this connection to the creek and all of that, people could come here and have lunch and ha take breaks and all of those things. As a person that ate lunch in... <laughs> the parking garage at the mall many times while the creek is obviously right there and you can kind of walk down it would be cool to have a space where you could like meet more people and hang out and yeah it is a really kind of interesting missing component from a neighborhood that is identified by its landscape the cherry creek but doesn't have as much green space as you would think yeah as you think about the redevelopment of Cherry Creek, it really has not had a lot of outdoor space. Um, and to the extent that it has, it's been mostly hardscape. So to the extent we can bring green, I think that's really great, especially next to the creek. And it just really, it, it suggests that connection as well. Um, and hopefully um, helps encourage people to come here on foot and by bike too. 
Sure, sure. So could you give us a timeline? Like, we're, again, we're still looking at this empty building in yeah. a giant parking lot. Yeah. Where could we may, maybe think about seeing this new housing and green space? When is that? Yeah, um, we'll continue infrastructure master planning and really start designing buildings in earnest so that hopefully by the end of 2024, we could break ground. Because of that large sort of shared infrastructure of um you know, unbundled shared parking underneath. It's probably three years to our first buildings in that public space being available. So that's 2027. Um, and hopefully the whole thing is built in about 10 years. Well, Amy Cara, thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Anyone else still worried about gridlock grinding Cherry Creek to a halt? After this short break, I'll be back with a developer behind a fascinating project in the Washington, D.C. suburbs that some people say has got this densification thing figured out. Justin Schur is one of the developers behind Tyson's, the hottest new thing in urban planning. Justin Schur, welcome to CityCast Denver. Thank you, Bree. It's a pleasure to be here. So um, I worked in urban planning randomly for four years. I took a weird detour. But in that time, I got to know how cities work. And I was actually just talking to my friend Yvette the other day, who's from my planning world. And I said, oh, we're talking about this, this thing, Tyson's Corner. It's like a big deal. And she's like, oh, been there. It's beautiful. So I want to start there. Why, why are planners so excited about what's happening with Tyson's Corner? That's a great question. And I'm glad they think Tyson's is beautiful. I would say Tyson's is in its awkward adolescence. So there is some beauty <laughs> in, an, in an adolescent, um, but it hasn't fully matured yet. And I think that's part of what makes Tyson so exciting. It is going through that awkward adolescence to become more of a transit-oriented, walkable community. And I think what makes that even more exciting is that if you can do that in a quintessential suburban, auto-dominated environment like Tyson's, there's a chance it could be replicated in other cities. And, uh, you know, it, it takes careful thought and planning and investment, but it can be done. So what was the challenge or what was the opportunity that people saw there or that developers saw there or folks that wanted to, you know, catalyze and build? I, I mean, I would love to hear. I'm just trying to get to like, what's the push and pull at, at, with Tyson's? Um, the concerns that people typically have in the suburbs is if I build a 20, 30 story building, how in the world is that not going to make more traffic? And I think providing that infrastructure allowed the conversation to be, okay, if we have four stations in Tyson's and we do develop in, at that level with that kind of density, can, can we sustain it? Can that happen? And so that was a bit of a collaborative conversation, many stakeholders uh, organized by the county that Tyson's is in, it's called Fairfax County, where there was discussion about, okay, if we're going to do this kind of rezoning that would allow the kind of density that I'm talking about, 30 stories, that's beneficial to developers. You know, developers like more density, they pay the same amount for the plot of land, whether they build one story or 30 stories. So if a big majority of their cost is the land value and they can capture more return from building higher, that's beneficial to them. On the flip side, the residents who live in that area, the constituents have concerns about traffic. If you can address those concerns, then they're okay with it. But there has to be a commitment. There has to be some teeth behind it. And that's something Fairfax County did very well with something called Transportation Demand Management or TDM. And they basically... Yeah. I was just going to say, if you could explain what TDM is. Yeah. I mean, in its purest form, when it comes to traffic congestion, there are supply side and demand side solutions, right? So supply and demand, like I didn't do great at economics in college, but I got that basic (laughs) principle down. (laughs) And the supply side is what we've done for 50 years. That is like, if you want to address traffic, you build more lanes, you make it wider, you add another road. You put put in more turning lanes and traffic signals. You do everything you can to make it easier for cars to get around. And that is a solution, although we've seen more in more recent decades that that's not sustainable. It costs a lot of money. We run out of land and there's something called latent demand. Like as soon as you build that extra lane, people are like, oh, it's free flowing. Let me go drive now. And it just as quickly as you build, it gets congested. So the demand side is saying, well, let's look at the infrastructure we have and how do we get 
more people to use less vehicles during the worst hours when it's congested. So you can do that through a number of methods. You can get people into transit. You can get people to carpool. You can get people to work from home, as we've been doing for the last three years. Or you can just say, if you're going to drive, just don't drive during that absolute worst hour. Do it you know, an hour or two earlier or an hour or two later. And that kind of spreading of the peak manages the demand. That's essentially what TDM is. Transportation demand management is either getting more people into fewer vehicles or kind of spreading the peak. So all of this sounds amazing in theory to me, right? We're getting people out of their cars. We're building um, things that are close to each other and making that space more walkable. Because again, we know if we know anything about suburban sprawl development, it's really, you can't even walk through a parking lot of a shopping center. Like there's no place for you to walk. But I know that there's still, you guys probably still got pushback. There's still got to be those, those NIMBY voices that say, I don't want this. How did you overcome that? No, that's a great question, Bree. I mean, I think the biggest one, and again, if you ask in any community, you know, the not in my backyard, as you mentioned, the NIMBYs, why they don't want higher density, mixed use, walkable development, but they focus on the density and they focus on the fact that that has to mean more cars. So what Fairfax County said was, okay, we're going to make sure that every development commits to a level of trip generation, auto generation during the worst hours, and we won't exceed it. And that number that they calculated wouldn't negative, if you stay underneath it, would not negatively impact the surrounding roadway network. So what they did is they said, what's the biggest pain point for the NIMBYs, the traffic? Well, let's eliminate it. We're going to set a goal. We're going to hold the developer accountable over an extended period of time. And that should be enough to get the the project approved and then demonstrate over time that it can be achieved. I think that's probably the like <laughs> not the biggest pain point in planning is like we have a plan. I swear it's awesome and then having to like it has to be implemented for it to work, but it's that it's that painful time when you have to convince people, I swear people are going to get out of their cars. I swear this. You know what I mean? Exactly. And and so, but th- this has been successful, right? I mean. Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of it, Bree. Your point is really well taken. You know, the the first part of this was to say, look, a condition of your development is that thou shalt not exceed this number of trips. And if thou does, <laughs> you will be fined a certain amount. And so there really were teeth behind it to make sure that it happened. And so the incentive was on the developer to perform. And that way they could guarantee to the NIMBYs, like, look, it's in their best interest. They're going to pay a lot of money, in some cases millions of dollars, if they don't perform. Now we have data from the last 10 years that says, well, not only were those peak hour thresholds managed, but they were outperformed on average by 30%. But being able to have those things prove out over time does make it, to your point, much easier to sell in the future. Yeah, I'll be interested to see. I'm looking more into Tyson's and seeing how it works and seeing how we can look at Cherry Creek in a similar way and say, how can we how can we tweak these little things that might get some folks out of their cars or might get folks to be able to afford to live closer, you know? I don't know. There's so many ways to think about it. Well, and it doesn't take a lot. You know, I mean, sometimes the difference between a congested area and not is the difference of 10%. Right. You know, so we're, we're not talking about changing the world. You know, changing the margins can really make a big difference. Totally. Justin Short, thank you so much for joining me. Bri, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. It was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. So far on Cherry Creek Week, we've heard from wealthy neighbors, longtime residents, historians, workers, city planners, and now the developers. And it's time to bring it all back together and have a real conversation about the hard stuff. We're all going to get worked up about parking here. <laughs> yeah, but, I know. I was um, like, I have a <laughs> real big opinion about parking. <laughs> right. So the the, the, <clears throat> the the truth is, you know, everybody complains about parking in Cherry Creek. There's plenty of parking in Cherry Creek. Cherry Creek Week concludes tomorrow on CityCast Denver. I'm talking to a panel of experts and hammering out real answers to our most vexing problems. And if you can't wait for more... 
you can find your own way to Cherry Creek. Or not. Hi, this is Karen in Lincoln Park. I um, don't go to Cherry Creek anymore because in 2020, uh, RTD cut the number one bus line that ran from here to Cherry Creek um, so that it no longer goes to that area. So I don't go anymore. Thanks. And here's what else Denverites are talking about. Child care. We heard from a couple parents about the imminent closure of the Wonder Academy in the Golden Triangle. They say it's a truly fantastic, locally and woman-owned child care center, but it's shutting down in July since the landowners have sold, with the promise of a big new apartment building in its place. So we want to hear from you. Are you having trouble accessing the child care you need? There's talk of a child care crisis, but thanks to Governor Polis, we have free universal preschool. So what's up? The babysitter hotline is officially open. Text us or leave us a voicemail at 720-500-5418. Tell us your babysitting sitch at 720-500-5418. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed the show, why not take a minute to tell the person who has access to the abandoned nightclub below the Cherry Creek Mall about us. Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Denver, by texting Denver to 66866. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See you later. What up, 420? 420, blaze it. 420, we're talking about development. (laughs) No weed. Sorry. That's how I want to start this episode.